Hey guys, welcome to Digital Strini channel on YouTube. And if you haven't already done so, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button right now. And after watching this video, if you happen to like it, go ahead and hit the like button. Now in this video, I'm gonna talk about uh, residual and recurrent neural networks. Well, in fact, residual and uh, recurrent blocks that you can use to define a neural network. And in this example, we are going to look at the context in the context of unit, okay? So if you ever looked at uh, residual units or recurrent unit, or if you happen to hear the term R2 unit, which is a residual recurrent new, uh, unit, then you are watching the right video, okay? So uh, let's jump in. So first of all, if you look at the unit architecture, it is built with uh, repetitive blocks. You see these three blue, these three blue ones. Uh, again, you have a convolutions uh, and the blue arrow here represents a convolution plus ReLU activation. And these are all re uh, very repetitive. And if you just look at one of these, then uh, you can see that there is input going in, right? I mean, there's input and then a convolution operation followed by ReLU another convolution followed by ReLU, and then you have the output which goes into the next block. And these blocks are very similar, so you can use one small piece of code in a repetitive way to define an entire network. Now the question is, can we enhance this model, the standard unit, to benefit from the residual and recurrent networks? And of course the answer is yes, and let's see why, okay? First of all, starting with the residual network. Uh, and here is a, uh, image that has been defined as part of the original ResNet uh, paper. And whenever you see residual network, you see this line almost, uh, you know, that we call shortcut connection. We'll, we'll understand this in a, uh, you know, uh, in a little while, hopefully. So these networks, the residual networks, they were proposed, why? Because there was a problem when working with very deep convolutional networks. What happens when you have very deep convolutional networks? For example, VGG is a great architecture, but if you keep increasing the number of layers, you'll run into something called a vanishing gradient problem, meaning your weights are updated incrementally. If that increment goes very small, okay, then your weights are not updated at all, right? I mean, the, the, the change in the weights is very, very uh, insignificant. Why would that go very small? Well, uh, this is called back propagation for a reason because it goes from the final layer to the one before to the one before and the and so on and these weights are actually multiplied so if your last uh, layer has a weight of let's say uh, 0 0.001 and then the previous one 0 0.001 let's multiply those two okay you get 0.501 right and so on so you keep propagating then by the time you go to the first one your your weights become very insignificant. Again, I definitely encourage you to learn more about backpropagation in general, but the idea here is backpropagation happens because of this chain rule where you're multiplying the weights from all of these layers, you know, when you're updating the weights. And uh, if those weights get so small or if that increment in weights gets so small, the model is not changing. And that happens with uh, very deep neural networks, okay? That's hopefully uh, a quick, a nice summary of uh, the need for residual networks, meaning now we know the problem exists, which is uh, the vanishing gradient. Also, when you're stacking all of these convolution layers, when you have these deep uh, networks, we saw in one of our very early videos where you see that the curves, the training curves for uh, training goes down, but for the validation data, in fact, is going up when you look at the loss. What does that reflect? It reflects that the model is overfitting for very complicated networks. So. Uh, it, it hurts the generalization ability of the network in general, right? So when you put very deep networks. So, but how can we overcome that? Because some problems require complicated networks. So to overcome that, ResNet architecture was introduced, okay, where it adds the idea of this skip connections, meaning information from here can directly pass on to like two, three layers down. Okay, and we'll see why that helps, uh, uh, at least uh, try to understand it uh, to some extent. But let me redo this image like down here. And on the left-hand side is a traditional network. On the right-hand side is the ResNet. They look very similar, except for the fact that here, instead of function f of x, you have f of x minus x. Why is it f of x minus x? Because we are providing an identity function up here and we are adding it to the output here. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll, let's zoom into this in a minute. But first of all, in traditional neural network, 
each layer is feeding to the next layer okay so here the weight layer which is the convolution layer for example go into activation and then another convolution and another activation and so on okay you may have batch normalization in between and dropouts but then each they're all very nicely connected one after the other in a residual network okay each layer feeds to the next layer just like we saw here except sometimes it's directly connected to the layers about two three hops away so in this case like a three hops away it's connected here and then it's connected another few hops away and so on okay now let's zoom in a bit and then uh, understand this a bit uh, uh, by the way the the forward propagation is faster through the residual connection because of the shortcut layers okay but let's have a quick look up here so in a traditional network you're mapping your x directly to the output okay f of x think of this as a black box input is coming in which is x and you have an output and you're mapping your input to the output by updating the weights right so that's exactly what you're doing here so your x is directly mapped to your f of x so you're learning how to map or you're updating the weights or learning how to map your input to the output which is f of x as uh, uh, in, a, in a residual network okay because this is fx minus x let's call this r of x okay what what is my r which is basically my f of x that is the uh, uh, up here minus this x because this x is identity okay so if you rearrange that what you really are passing to the activation or the next layer is this f of x just like in the regular network okay but then in this example this f of x is nothing but your r which is residual plus this x so in summary this block is not learning f of x but this block is learning r of x that's the difference why why would you care about it well look at what r is it's fx minus x it's actual function that goes to the next uh, uh, i mean the actual function that defines this entire block okay minus uh, the x is our residual so r of x is actually it's learning our residual network is actually learning the residual what is residual when you have something and you take something off whatever is remaining is residual right so this block instead of learning how to represent a function f of x this is learning how to represent the residual which is r of x that's the only difference between these two okay so that's why they are called residual networks and if you wonder how to code it again don't don't be intimidated by all of this this is pretty straightforward on the left hand side i'm just showing convolution block how do you just define a regular convolution block nothing no residual you have conv batch normalization activation okay con batch normalization activation another convolution another batch normalization another activation okay so that's how you define a regular convolution block Residual convolution block is very simple. Again, you have a uh, same thing going on here, right? You have convolution, batch normalization, activation, con, batch normalization, activation. Another convolution, another batch normalization in this example, another con, another batch normalization, but now I'm not doing activation yet. In some forms of residual network, there are many forms of residual network, you do perform activation and then you do the sum, okay? In this example, after the second batch normalization, we are directly looking at the x skip connection or shortcut and what is my shortcut my shortcut is basically my input x going through one by one convolution okay that's it and then i'm doing batch normalization after this and then adding these two so that's what we are doing adding the conv and adding the shortcut right there layers dot add okay and finally all of this will go through the ArrayLue activation that's it so you'll find lots of code out uh, online for residual networks and resnets and uh, residual units and so on but as long as you understand that hey the block basically makes sense and then you can use that block in in building any network i think that's all that's all it comes down to okay now let's look at the recurrent convolution network and recurrent by the name means something is happening multiple times over and over that's what recurrent is okay now let's look at a uh, neuron a feed forward neuron so an input or this can be a block think of this as a convolution block what happens input comes in and there is an output and you're mapping your output to input via function x 
This is what we saw in the previous screen, right? So this is the function x. In a recurrent neuron, I think I did the arrow wrong here. The output should go back to input here. But an input is going through exactly like your regular feed forward neuron, except there is a feedback connection. So the output is going back into the uh, uh, input. Now this feedback connection can happen multiple times. Your n can be equals to uh, five. So it's going back uh, five times before it does something five times before it hands it over to the next neuron or the next block. That's what recurrent uh, basically means. So the recurrent network uses this feedback connection to store the information over time. So if my time steps equals to five, that means it, it does this repetitive, uh, it sees the data for five time steps. Think of this as that, okay? Within the same neuron, it actually has information about five time steps. This is why recurrent networks are very, very useful in, uh, for example, time series type of analysis, okay? And uh, they use context information as time steps increase, right? And the network leverages more and more uh, neighborhood information because as the as the context is increasing, as you are seeing the same, uh, the neuron is the input data is the same, but then it's seeing it uh, over the five time uh, timestamps. Okay, for example, uh, and these recurrent and convolutional neural networks can be combined in image-based uh, applications. Usually, you see recurrent networks in, for example, like I already mentioned time series and forecasting type of uh, uh, applications, but we can combine this as part of convolutional neural networks for image-based uh, applications. So here, with these convolution, recurrent convolution networks, the network evolves over time, even though the input is static, because again, you're looking uh, through this n number of times, okay, in n steps. And each unit obviously is influenced by the neighboring units, which means it includes the context information of an image, okay? So uh, let's uh, uh, graphically have a quick look at it. So let's say this is a recurrent convolution block, okay? Again, I, when I say convolution block, you have convolution, batch normalization, activation, and so on, right? So you can have multiple convolutions. But what's going on when you define something as a recurrent is when you unwrap this, this could be at time uh, equals to zero, it does a convolution operation. At time equals to one, it does another convolution, time two, another one, time three, another one. So you have information for four time series within the same uh, patch uh, as shown in this example here. Now you can use these recurrent block uh, uh, to create a convolutional neural network, okay? So here is an example convolution neural network where you have layer one, which is purely convolution. This is a convolution block, so no recurrent. So it applies and then it goes through max pooling like it normally does, and then you have the next block. So in this example, this is a recurrent convolution block, meaning uh, the, uh, within this patch, things happen n number of times, okay? Because this is recurrent. So it completes this and then moves on to the next one. So you can put together convolutional networks using these recurrent convolution blocks where things happen within uh, each block n number of times. So uh, just like uh, a regular convolution or residual convolution, this is just another block that you define that gets uh, that, that you can use to substitute your regular convolutional uh, block, that's it. And uh, again, uh, a quick Google search will give you a lot of code when it comes to recurrent uh, convolutional blocks. And here is one that I got from this source at the bottom of the page. And I uh, just wanna show you one thing, that's it. So as part of your input, you're telling, uh, you're providing how many times you would like to repeat this. Uh, these these operations in this for loop and that's all that is if you n equals to three or recurrent number equals to three You're doing this for that many times Okay, that's what recurrent is and uh, just to summarize this discussion here in a is a uh, a regular feed forward convolutional unit, right? So you have a uh, input convolution plus ReLU convolution plus ReLU and output and here it is a recurrent convolution. So you have input convolu, convolu, but then this part repeats n number of times and then hands the output over. And this part repeats n number of times and hands the output over and so on. Residual, we know, we just looked at it. Residual is basically you have your uh, uh, regular network, very similar to regular network, except the output you are summing that with your identity, which is the shortcut connection, and then uh, pass it on to the next step. 
Okay, so this is your uh, residual and you can combine these two like recurrent and residual convolution networks. And again, if you ever hear the terms RRCU or R2 unit, I think that's some, uh, some people call that recurrent residual uh, unit, then uh, what we're talking about is using this block as part of uh, your unit. So just a quick summary here, you have your unit, Typically, you build this with convolutional blocks, and these convolutional blocks are conv, conv, output, right? So, and again, you can have batch normalization and other things as part of uh, as part of your convolutional block. If you replace this with a recurrent convolution block, you call you have a recurrent unit. If you replace that with a residual convolution block, you have a res uh, residual unit. And finally, obviously, if you re um, uh, you know replace that with a recurrent and residual convolutional block, you have a R two unit. Okay, so this is a quick summary. Now, what in the world is a tension unit? Like I promised, uh, stay tuned for the next video. In the next video, I'm gonna talk about a tension unit. And after that, let's actually put all of these to practice in Python, okay? So I just wanna provide you with this theoretical background or at least at a high level, so you know what's happening when we get to the actual code in a couple of uh, videos. Okay, let's meet again in the next video. If you want to be notified whenever that gets uploaded, please subscribe to this channel, okay? Thank you guys.